So there was a line in the first song that made me swallow uh, pretty hard. Our God is surely in this place. Early on, I mean, talk about a great reminder as to why we gather. Where two or more are gathered, he's with us. We got two or more? You don't have to look around. Yes, we do. And that made me swallow hard this morning because I thought to myself, whoo, if he's here, which I believe he is, is he going to turn and ask me to leave? Well, see, we, we live in a uh, one and done society, one and done culture. You know what I mean when I say one and done? Okay, so it's a one and done season. Uh, how many of you watch TV? How many own a TV? How many know that there is a contraption that is called a TV? Okay, good. We got all hands up, all right? Um, singing shows. After the Super Bowl, all the singing shows start again, right? The Voice and American Idol. And basically, you got one chance to get through to the next level. Um, if you don't get a chair turned on The Voice, they, all the judges tell you how good you were and that they should have turned, but they still didn't turn. You go home, right? One and done. Same with American Idol. If you don't sing enough, you don't get the, you're going to... Okay, there's like four of you that watch that show. It's been on for a while. Okay, so singing shows. How about, uh, how about uh, food shows? Anybody watch food shows? Anybody like to eat? Anybody ate yet today? Who are doing some participation at all? Food shows. So we got shows like Great British Baking Show. Uh, what else? We got Chopped. Nailed it? Nailed it? That's, a, that's, a, that's a food show? I didn't know that one. Okay. Um, but, oh, wow. Okay, so there's a, lot more, there's a lot more cooking shows than I know about. But same type of thing. If, uh, if you don't cook a good enough meal or piece of a meal, you go home. And you don't want to be the one that says, I was one and done. Okay, we live in Spokane. How many of you know we got a pretty decent basketball team here in Spokane? Yeah, okay. More than watch the Idol, which is good, American Idol. Uh, you know, when we get to the time where it's the, uh, the big dance, March Madness, you know, if you don't win, it's one and done. You go home. Track it with me? So you know what that means. Okay, modern-day poet, uh, philosopher, a guy by the name of Marshall Mathers put out a poem in 2002 that says something like, you only get one shot, do not miss your chance to blow, this opportunity comes once in a lifetime. Anybody heard that poem? Okay, a couple of you, good, good. Um, one and done, society. In our stories of Scripture today, if we're to live by that one and done type of, wow, Peter should have been kicked out. <laughs> right? Someone say amen. Amen. Peter should have been kicked out. Not me. I'm not Peter, but Peter should have been kicked out. Let's pray and I'll tell you why. Uh, God, I'm in awe that you would choose to spend the morning with us. And I recognize that in all reality, you're already here, and that it's really our choice to spend it with you, but I thank you that you are here in this place. I thank you for both the peace that brings, but at the same time, I thank you for the outright oh, unsettled that brings, Lord, because we should have a sense of awe and amazement when we're in your presence. Lord, we're telling a story this morning that um, we need to hear. Frankly, that we probably just need to be reminded of. So I pray that you'd give us ears to hear. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you've got a Bible or an iPad or a phone, go ahead and grab it and turn to Psalm 53 and Mark chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible, there hopefully is a brown book in front of you under the seat. You can turn there. If you don't know where it is, it's uh, Psalms in the middle. Mark is towards the back. Uh, use the table of contents or your neighbor to find it. Um, in, a, in, a, in our church this year, we're doing a series called Where's Jesus? We do a series where we are looking at different passages of Scripture every day, um, asking the question of where's Jesus with the hope that by the end of the year we will have read through the Bible. Okay? So the Bible in a year, and each day we're asking the question, where is Jesus? Today's text in the Gospels is Mark chapter 14. It begins in verse 53. Now, the first two verses in this passage show Jesus being uh, taken to the high priest's home after he was arrested. 
All right, and then the next 10 verses show this sham of a trial that goes on with witnesses making accusations about Jesus, and you know nobody can really get their story straight. And it wasn't until the high priest asked Jesus, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And, and Jesus responded, I am. That's when you know the guilty verdict started being yelled. All right, so that was all taking place upstairs in the, the high priest's house. But down in the courtyard, we pick up our story in verse 66 of Mark chapter 14. Meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and said, you were one of those with Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And he went into the entryway. Just then, a rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling the others, this man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again. And a little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter and said, you must be one of them because you are a Galilean. And Peter swore, a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't even know this man that you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. And Peter broke down and wept. One and done. But that wasn't the way it worked for Peter, right? He had three chances. After the first denial, he should have had his membership card revoked. After the second denial, he should have been kicked out of the Jesus Club. After the third denial, he should have had his, hi, I'm Peter. I follow Jesus' name tag, torn off his robe. One shot. One chance, one opportunity, you're out, one and done. And if the stories in the Old Testament are any indication of how serious God took this, then realistically, denying God should have got Peter booted. You look at our passage for today, and Moses is reminding God of something God said about himself as to how seriously he takes sin. Numbers chapter 14, verse 18. The Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion, but he does not excuse the guilty. He lays the sins of the parents upon the children, their entire family is affected, even the children in the uh, the third and fourth generation. Wow. Right? So you look at then Peter who denied God not once, not twice, but three times. Oh, his great-grandchildren. They're not, hmm. This whole denying God bit was taken pretty seriously in the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures. When Joshua, who was Moses' mentee, was finalizing the agreement between God's people and God, he said, grab a big stone, and let me tell you why. Joshua chapter 24, verse 27, in the King James Version, and Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us. For it hath heard all the words of the Lord, which he had spake, great word, which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. Let this stone remind you of what we've committed to so that you don't deny God. Job. Man of Sorrows, right? We, we, most of us know his story, he lost everything and n- never really cursed God. But there was one time when he was reminding God of, of how he had not done a few things. Like he had never worshipped the moon, never worshipped the sun. And we see this in Job chapter 31, verse 28. If so, Job said, if I had worshipped them, I should be punished by the judges. For it would mean that I had denied the God of heaven. Job knew the seriousness of denying God. And the Israelite people did too. Listen to what they said through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 59. It says, we know we have rebelled and denied the Lord. We have turned our backs on God. We know how unfair and oppressive we have been, carefully planning our deceitful lies. The people understood the consequences of denying God. And Peter grew up in a time, in a culture, in a family unit, in a, in a religious practice that 
knew that if you denied God, it wasn't good. So if we jump to the other passage that, you told, that, I, that I told you we were in today, Isaiah, uh, Psalm 53, we see it begin like this. Only fools say in their heart, there is no God. We could probably stop there. But the psalmist continues, they are corrupt and their actions are evil. No one of them is good, not a single one. God looks down from heaven on the entire human race. He looks to see if anyone is truly wise, if anyone seeks God. But no, all have turned away. All have become corrupt. Not a single one does good. Not a single one. Will those who do evil never learn? They eat up my people like bread and wouldn't think of praying to God, but terror will grip them. Terror like they have never known before. God will scatter the bones of your enemies. You will put them to shame, for God has rejected them. Only a fool says in his heart there is no God. Only a fool denies God, and God's going to take care of them. If that was the case, then God should have kicked Jesus. No, not Jesus, not Jesus. Jesus should have kicked Peter out. You can say amen. I know it's uncomfortable, and you probably don't agree with it. But you can say amen to that because you look at Peter and how many times did he deny Jesus? Once? Nope. Twice? Nope. Four times? <laughs> Trick question. Nope. Three times. Right? Jesus himself had said to Peter and to the rest of the 11 disciples right before Jesus was sending them out on a mission trip, he reminded them of this. This is directly from the mouth of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Pretty clear cut, isn't it? I mean, that's from the mouth of Jesus. Church's greatest uh, church planter and missionary, the Apostle Paul, was given a similar message to his mentee, Timothy, when he said this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. This is a trustworthy saying, Paul writes, if we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship with him, we will reign with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. One and done. Peter should have been kicked out. Peace out, Girl Scout. Like, what kind of rock are you now, Jesus should have said. Did Peter get kicked off the show? Was he asked to exit? Did he get sent home in the first weekend of the tournament? No. Why not? It doesn't add up. I mean, from what we just read in the Old Testament, it doesn't make sense at all. And yet, in another one of the life stories of Jesus, the author John, in the last chapter of the book, tells the story of Peter and his buddies fishing in a boat, and on the, on the shore they see a guy who is cooking fish by a fire, and it ends up being Jesus, and you know, I, I think it's Peter that jumps in and swims back. Am I right? Okay, good. Uh, and, and Jesus and Peter, they have this conversation about, do you love me? Yes, then take care of my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, then feed my sheep. And, you know, in, in essence, Jesus' way of saying, look, I'm, I'm not kicking you out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you going. And from that point on, we really see Peter step up. Well, we saw him in the dark denying not too many days later, he was declaring Acts chapter 2, he was the first one to step up to the mic, to the podium, to the platform and say, wait a second, let me tell all you guys about this Jesus that we're hearing about. So why did Jesus not kick him out? Well, first, I'm thankful that he didn't, and I'll come back to that. I'm very thankful that he didn't. But here's gonna two reasons I think he didn't. The first, um, it has to deal with relationship. Abby and I were talking about uh, different scenarios of one, one and done on Tuesday of this last week, and, and we got to the idea of relationships. And she works at, at Whitworth uh, with college students, and, you know, that's oftentimes the time where romances bloom and blossom, and it's also the times when romances crash and crumble. And so she gets to see all of that back and forth. And we started talking about relationships and how many relationships last when there's the one and done rule. <laughs> not too many, right? 
I mean, if the first time this person you're interested in, if the first time they fail, you're like, sorry, can't have that, I'm out. I've been married over 25 years, and I can't count how many times I've messed up. And Abby should have said, peace out, Girl Scout. Right? But she doesn't. Why? Why? It comes back to the person actually who's being offended. Not the offender, but the person who's being offended. And whether or not they respect, desire, pursue the relationship in which they are being offended. It's all about relationship. In the Numbers passage where I showed you earlier where Moses told God that God had said he does not forgive, like does not excuse the guilty, God, God had plenty of opportunities and plenty of reason to kick the Israelites out. If you know the story of Scripture, they should have been kicked out in like, well, Genesis 3, okay, so pretty early. Um, and yet God never kick them out. And especially in this situation, God just rescued them, mighty miracles, you know, all these things, and he's providing for them along the way, and they just keep complaining. And they just keep, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to be around them. But Moses, in the time he reminded God that you don't excuse the guilty, also reminded God of how slow he was to anger and how quick he was to forgive. And out of that comment, I actually see relationship being the thing that turned God's mind. Uh, Numbers chapter 14, you can just listen, verses 17 to 20. Please, Lord, Moses said, prove that your power is as great as you have claimed. For you have said, the Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion, but he does not excuse the guilty. He lays the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations, in keeping with your magnificent, unfailing love, please pardon the sins of the people. This is Moses begging God, right? Just as you have forgiven them ever since they left Egypt. And then in verse 20, it says, then the Lord replied, I will pardon them as you have requested. As you have requested in our readings for yesterday, in Numbers chapter 10, God was speaking of Moses, and he said, of, of all the people in my house, Moses is the one I trust. He's the one I speak to face to face. God had relationship with him. So when Moses said, wait, hold on, to, wait a second, God said, Be because you're saying it. Because we're in relationship. God's saying, I'm going to take that first step. Now, if you think back to Psalm 53, the first five verses are pretty miserable. Would you agree? I mean, only a fool says in his heart, there is no God. Nobody's good. Uh, all the bad people, they eat up God's people like bread. God's going to terrorize them. It's going to be awful. And we, if we just stopped at verse 5, it would not have been a good ending. But you look at verse 6, and the psalmist asks, who will come from Mount Zion to rescue Israel? When God restores his people... Jacob will shout with joy, and Israel will rejoice. You notice here is God taking the first step back to the people. It's God saying, I, I just explained how you all were, but I still want to be in a relationship with you. You know, Jesus may have said, if you deny me, we'll deny him, but how many times did he say something else? You're, we're talking about Peter here. Peter at one point was brave enough to come to Jesus and say uh, in Matthew chapter 18, he said, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Seventy-seven times. Or if you got the asterisk down on the bottom, Jesus replied, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Math whizzes in here. How many times is that? 490, of course, Jesus is making a point that you just can't count that high, but if it truly was 490 times, Peter's got 487 to go. It's no wonder Jesus didn't kick him out. I mean, in the Hebrew, it doesn't say, how many times must I forgive someone? In the Hebrew, Peter asks, how many times should I forgive my brother? Meaning there's relationship. And Jesus says, way more than you can count. And then he lives it out. Because Peter denies him. And yet, who takes the first step back? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. 
And if you remember nothing else from today, remember that, okay? It's God that takes the first step towards us. It's God that has said, okay, you've messed up, but I'm still here for you. I think, uh, I think it was Paul that says something, you know, even if we remain unfaithful, he remains faithful. So that, that's the one thing you should take away. Now, also remember, here's a subtle number two reason. Peter responded. He responded to this returning from Christ, even before he realized and knew that there was going to be a, a turning from Christ or a returning at the end of the, the denial, what happened? You may see him, I don't know him, I don't know him, I swear I don't know him. And then he remembers that Jesus had said by the time the rooster crows three times, then what happened? He wept. He realized, oh, oh. And perhaps he thought back to Jesus saying, if you deny me, I'll deny you. But then maybe he had that little mental battle of, wait, he also said that 77 times 7 thing. Oh, which, uh. I am thankful that Jesus did not kick Peter out of the club. Because if he had, which he would have had the right to do, he should also kick me out. should also kick you out. You know, when we talk about our God is in this place, and, I, and, and you think I jokingly say, he should have asked me to leave? No. <laughs> like, if we're one and done, I should be out. Frankly, just from today. Not even this last week or the last month or the last years. Is it one and done with Christ for us? Have you lived such a life that you think that you can no longer return? Let me tell you today, whether you're in the building or whether you're watching online, you have not gone so far to where Jesus will not forgive you. You have not gone so far. One of Jesus' best friends denies him, not once but three times in his hour of greatest need. But you can't get much worse than that. And yet the first thing Jesus does is give him a piece of fish when he gets to the beach. Talk to a man through his belly and then say, let me... Let me, let me tell you, I forgive you. We may not as vocally as Peter did deny Christ. We may not have three times to say out loud, I don't know him. Oh, I don't follow him. A curse on me if I've ever even gone to church. Like Jason was talking about, I'm the other 37% or 63% or whatever the math on that is. Hey, we may not ever verbally say that, but the Apostle Paul, in talking to another mentee, a guy named Titus, says people deny God by the way they live. That's Titus 1.16. At some point, we all have. The psalmist was clear about that. Our song for today, verse 3, says, no one, all have turned away, all have become corrupt. No one does good, not a single one. If God subscribed to our one and done society the church will be pretty empty this morning. Not just this building, but every church. I am thankful that Jesus doesn't follow those same rules. Now, I'm not sitting here telling us just, to, okay, well, it's a free ticket. Do whatever we want because Jesus will forgive you. No, we've got to do what Peter did. We've got to show some remorse. We've got, we've got, to, we've got to turn back to him. We also need to be reminded that we haven't gone too far. We don't only get one chance. We don't only get one shot. We don't only get one opportunity. Jesus hasn't won and done to us. Let's not one and done him. We're going to pray that responsive prayer again, the exact same one that we did earlier. Uh, we're going to pause at like every screen. Got that, Tane? We're going to pause at like every screen and let the words that we prayed soak in. Uh, Tane, when you see my head nod, you can switch to the next 